Gareth and what he has to tell you. So I'll just introduce my colleague Rosie from Macmillan who will do the introduction for Gareth. Thank you very much, Jenny, and thank you everyone for tuning in this afternoon. Um, if you're having any difficulties with the sound, um, then please put us a message um, in the questions or the chat box to the right hand side of your screen um, and I'll get through them um, and come back to you with possible solutions. Um, I'm Rosie, the Associate Commissioning Editor for Study Skills at Macmillan International Higher Education. And it's a pleasure to be working with JS Group on this series of webinars. Um, I'm delighted to introduce you today to Gareth Hughes um, from the University of Derby. Um, Gareth, as some of you might know, um, has been working on the University Mental Health Charter um, and on various other projects with Student Minds. And I'm really excited um, to hear the tips and things that he's got to share with us this afternoon. We'll have some time at the end of today's session for questions. So if you've got any questions, thoughts, feedback on the session um, that you'd like to put to Gareth, then again, please put those in the questions um, box and we'll get through as many as we can at the end of the session. Um, I'll be putting a few questions to Gareth um, for the main part of today's session. Um, and yeah, we'll start with this question then. Um, so why is it sometimes difficult to feel motivated to do something that you want to do or know that you need to do, Gareth? Yeah, hi everyone. I'm sorry, I, I, I think a little glitch in my technology for a moment ago. Um, yeah, so it, great to be talking to all of you about, about this today. And I think we all of us experience problems with motivation at some point or another. Um, it's a thing that most students come across at some point during the course of their degree. Um, and particularly, it can be frustrating when you, you actually know you want to do something, you want to engage with something, and yet you somehow can't quite bring yourself to sit down and actually do the piece of work. And I think there's a number of reasons as to why that sometimes happens. So let's just, just look at what some of those common barriers might be. So the first most obvious one is that if you just don't find a subject interesting, and across the course of, of a degree, across the course of, a, of some kind of study, it's not unusual to come across some things that you're just less interested in, that they just seem less relevant or less exciting or less fun. And we'll look at some ways in which you can perhaps tackle that in a moment. Then there's also the experience of, of negative emotions. If you're feeling very stressed or very highly emotionally aroused or very anxious, we know that that has a particular impact on your, the way your brain is functioning overall. And as a result of which, it can just be more difficult to focus and concentrate on what you're doing. And we often will then try and kind of hide away from the thing that's making us anxious. So if that's a piece of academic work, we try and hide from it to try and make that negative feeling go away. The third thing is whether or not you personally believe you are capable of doing it, because if you feel uh, when we feel we're not up to doing something, when we feel we don't have the skills or we don't know how to tackle it or we don't have the resources, we can very often then just feel like, well, I'm, I'm just going to look silly or I'm not going to do it well or I'm going to fail at it. And, and then that makes us want to kind of, again, hide away from it and not have to engage with it because we don't like feeling incompetent, particularly if it's something that other people can see. Whereas if you feel capable of doing it, if you feel you have the ability and the resources to do it, it's so much easier to maintain your motivation. Then one of the big things, of course, that many students have talked about over the course of the last years is environment and personal circumstances. If you're having to study in a shared space where you've maybe got noise around you and it's much more difficult to focus, again, that will be a less pleasurable, less fulfilling experience overall. And so your desire to actually sit, want to sit down and do it will be disrupted. Routine and habit is one that I think we need to pay specific attention to because it's very easy to, to really underestimate the impact that routine and habit has on motivation. And for many students, depending on what you're studying and how many hours a week you're studying, there might be long blocks of time which are, are unstructured unless you take control of them. And one of the things that we know that happens is if you don't take control of that, if you aren't active during those long blocks of time when you've not really got anything else to do, what happens is we become lethargic and, and, and we lose enthusiasm, we lose energy, and then it's much more difficult to haul ourselves back up and get ourselves to actually engage with a piece of academic work. Whereas if you have regular routines and habits that keep you busy and keep you active, getting yourself down to doing a piece of work is so much easier. And then the final thing is your well-being. And we know that you know if you're if you're feeling stressed, as I said earlier on, but also if you have a cold or a flu or you're feeling a bit isolated or lonely, all of these things have an impact on the way in which your brain works and the way in which your mind actually functions. And that impacts then on your learning and your ability to perform academically. So we'll have a look at, at, at all those things today and, and ways of trying to break through all of that. Thank you, Gareth. Um, 
it can be difficult to stay motivated if you're not interested in or you're not enjoying a particular module or subject. So what advice do you have for students who find themselves in that position? Yeah, so we'll start with our first barrier that we talked about on the previous slide, which is finding a way to actually make it interesting finding a way to get back into caring about the piece of work that you're actually doing. Because if you really are passionately engaged with a piece of work, if you think it's really important, if you're really enjoying it, if you're finding fulfillment in it, if you think there's an important argument in it, it's much easier to motivate yourself to sit down and do it. When it's something that you just think is boring and you, you're not really that bothered about it, much, much harder to actually then get yourself to sit down and do the piece of work. So actually doing a piece of work at the beginning, I normally say to students, do three things when you get an assignment set for you. First of all, be clear about what it is you're being asked to do. What's, what's the question? What's the task that you're being set? How is it that your academic wants you to do that piece of work? And if you look at the marking brief that you're given, for instance, that's a, that will give you some very clear, very good clues as to exactly what it is your academic wants to say in the piece of work and how they therefore want you to go about doing it. But the third thing to ask yourself then is why? Why do I care about this piece of work? Why is it interesting? Why is it relevant? Why is it important? And to try and find some emotional connection to that piece of work, whether it's passion about the subject or it's frustration about the subject or why that it's you know, annoyance or there's something about this that you'd like to um, use to change the world or make things better or explain to other people. Whatever it is, find your way into to, to connecting to it emotionally, because once you're positively emotionally connected to the piece of work, then it's much more easy to drive. And this is about connecting to the content of the work, not about what grade do I get, because that can distract us. It's, if you can let go of the grade for a little while, actually, that will be really helpful. And focus instead on the content of what it is you've been asked to produce and try to connect to that emotionally, because then that will drive you forward. Because the word motion is an emotion, because they come from the same Greek root word. It's our emotions that drive us forward. So try to engage with that if you possibly can. The other thing to think about then is to try and think about those things that actually do give you meaning and pleasure and that use your strength, and then to find a way to try and connect them to the piece of work that you're doing. So you start by thinking about well, what are the things that I find meaningful? Now that can be a tricky question to get to, get to sometimes. So some of the ways in which you might want to ask yourself that question is, well, what do I care about in the world? What, what am I passionate about? What do I believe in? What lights me up inside? Well, think about those times when you feel excited by something. What is it that's exciting you? What's getting you going? What gets you engaged in that way? Or what is it that you'd like to change in the world? What are the things in the world you really want to change? And then you maybe make a little list of all of the things that come up, whether they're related to your academic work or not, make a list of all of them. Then think about pleasure. What is it that gives you pleasure? Because it's different for different people. So what is it that you enjoy doing? Or, or when do you feel at your happiest? What is it that you're doing when you feel at your happiest? Or when do other people tell you you seem to be at your happiest and you seem to be enjoying yourself most, if, if you find that question difficult otherwise? Again, make a list of all of those things. And then think about what are your strengths? What, what are the things that you're good at? Now, some people find it difficult to talk about things that they're good at. So think about what, what do other people tell you? Or think about when you feel that you're most competent, when you feel really controlled and capable and that you're actually doing things. When you're feeling that, what are you doing? What's going on when you're doing that? What, what skills are you using when you're doing all of that? So if you make a list of all of those three things, what you can then do is use it to build a little Venn diagram for yourself. So here we have an example that we've done for a student already, their list of meaning, pleasure, and strength. And what you might say is there are some things that appear in all three lists, although they're phrased slightly differently because asking the different questions can make you think about it slightly differently. But if you then build a Venn diagram, you'll find that there are some things that are probably on all three lists. So for this student here, they're interested in nature, plants and ecology, traveling, being in other cultures and painting. And then whatever's in the middle of that Venn diagram, those are the things you can follow towards your career. Because if you're living a career that has meaning and is pleasurable and um, is using your strengths, you'll be in a job that's fulfilling, that's fun, um, and that you feel you're really good at. And then think about with your academic piece of work, okay, is there any way I can tie it to things that are in the middle of this diagram? And if I can't, can I tie it to some of the other things that are in the Venn diagram to give me a way in, to give me a way of connecting with the piece of work, to make it more relevant to me personally. So I personally want to do this piece of work because I've found a connection straight to it. Thank you, Gareth. Um, our habits and routines affect our motivation. And I think it's fair to say that some are more helpful than others, um, even if we don't kind of realise that at the time. How can students build a helpful routine that works for them? 
Yeah, and this can be quite a tr tricky thing, particularly if you've come from very regimented routines and structures before. So if you've come from school, let's say, or you've been working before and you've been going into work and working in a full-time job, and then you go to being a student where there are gaps in your day or there are gaps in your timetable. And it actually can be very easy to drift into a kind of lethargy where you're, you're not motivated and you're not getting anything done. But as I said earlier, one of the things that we know is that, I mean, we, we, we think having nothing to do would be lovely. You know, it sounds fantastic. Imagine having absolutely nothing to do would not be lovely. But actually, as a species, we're not designed for that. So we're really very not very good at it, which is why after a couple of weeks holiday, people even even on holiday can start to get a little bit bored. We need to be active. We need to be we need to have stretch in our lives. We need to have something that helps push us along and routine and habit help us to do that. It also makes us feel that we're in control of our lives. When we have routine and structure, we feel so much more in control of what we're doing because we're active and then we get things done. And because we're getting things done, our motivation then stays high. So there are two things that I generally see from students at two either extremes when people are struggling with this. The first is what we call the unplanned timetable. Now, to be honest, I very rarely see this written down. In fact, it would be odd to see it written down. But this is what students report to me. So we start the week off with a promise that I'm definitely going to do some work. I am absolutely going to do some work this week. Definitely. If I can just get myself to it, I'm going to do it. And then by late Monday evening, nothing's happened. The day seems to have drifted away. Bit of panic that it's not all working. Tuesday, feel dreadful that I haven't actually managed to start anything. So stay in bed and hide away and pretend that there's no work to do. Manage to get myself up, switch the computer screen on, stare at it, go into a trance, and eventually give up and put on Netflix. Up on Wednesday, into a lecture. I'm really, really, really definitely going to plan to do some work today. And then it kind of drifts away and doesn't happen. And then by Thursday, I'm asking around, hoping everyone's going to say, yeah, I haven't done any work either. But then that's not what they say. So then panic again, give up, just think you're not good enough. And by Friday, sleeping in, not going to the lectures, staring at your computer screen, and then talking to your family and friends about why you should give up and eventually finishing the week, soothing yourself with some satisfying videos on YouTube. Now, that is not unusual. I hear that a lot. And it's perfectly possible to pull out of that. And, and it is just a fact of the fact that the more we do nothing, the more we end up doing nothing. Um, so if you can get yourself going, get yourself started with a bit of structure and a bit of routine, that will start to carry you through. You'll feel better. You'll have more energy as a result. You'll be more motivated. And then you'll become more and more productive as time goes on. The trick is not to go to the other extreme and trying to take overly control of it with what we call the overplanned timetable. And this is something I have seen written down, where students basically just try and pack every day with absolutely everything they can possibly think of doing to the extent that there's actually no room in the day for them to breathe or eat. Sometimes on this timetable, we've got the student trying to do two things at once, which very rarely works. And whenever you're planning together a routine and a structure, you need to plan for different types of activity across the day. So we do need some time doing our academic work, but we also need time off. We do need time to rest and reflect. We need to get some exercise and some fresh air. We need to spend time with other people. These are all things we need as creatures, as human beings. These are needs. They're not wants. They're not things we can ignore. So we need to think about all of that. When am I going to get my meals? When am I going to cook them? Um, when am I going to get some fresh air and some exercise? When am I going to spend time with other people and have some fun? Because fun's important. Now that we're all able to join back up with each other again, trying to get some of that into our lives is really important as well. So generally what I would say is when you're planning a timetable, if you're struggling to fit it in on the page, it's not going to fit into your day. Plan in between activities, plan little buffer periods, little periods where you've not got anything planned in so that if something unexpected happens or something takes a bit longer, your day can absorb all of that. And then once you've got a timetable, try and stick to it wherever it's possible, but be realistic and accept the fact that sometimes it won't all work. And that doesn't mean you should give up. That just means you flex and you move. But if there's something you plan to do on Monday that you didn't get around to doing because something happened, you now know you need to make room for it later in the week. But when you've got a planned timetable and you're in control of it, you then know what you're trying to compensate for and you can stay in control. And then that will help you to stay much more motivated. I think there's lots of tips there for students to take away. Um, I think, you know, this is kind of almost the crux of today's session and what lots of students will be struggling with um, is so getting started on an assignment. And it can seem difficult and perhaps even impossible in that moment. What tips do you have, Gareth, for getting started with a piece of work? Yeah, this is a this is you're absolutely right. This is the crux for an awful lot of this kind of stuff. And I think there are a number of reasons why, particularly at the start of projects, we can become unstuck. I think it starts with the fact that what we get into our head is the finished piece of work. 
and trying to get to the finished piece of work straight away is impossible. So let's say you've been asked to write a 3,000 word essay or report, or you've been asked to conduct an experiment in a lab and produce a report afterwards, or you've been asked to produce an art piece of artwork on a particular theme using particular sets of materials or styles. And on the day that you're given that, the finished piece of work is some way away. But we tend to focus on that and think, well, how, how do I get to that? How do I get there? How do I get to that end point? And we try to rush through to it. But actually, we have to go through a process in order to get to the end point. And if we can accept that and just focus on the first step of the process today, then it takes the pressure off. Because if you try and create a whole piece of work in one go, you just get overwhelmed. You get anxious. Because you're anxious, you'll find it more difficult to think clearly. And then you'll just want to go away and hide and pretend it isn't happening. And then your motivation will drift away completely. So what you see on the page here is, a, is a, quite a well-known diagram for how creativity actually happens. And creating academic work, whatever discipline you're in, creating a new piece of work is a creative process. Creation is about bringing, putting together something new. So what we need to think about doing is the fact that to begin with, we need to do what we call diverge. Divergence is just simply beginning to build ideas, reading, adding new thoughts, developing possibilities. You will, hopefully, if you give yourself enough time, you'll come up with lots of ideas about what you could do, most of which won't work and will drop away. And that's OK, because you're not putting the weight on each individual idea to be perfect. You're just developing them and building them. And over time, a number of them might come together. And then you keep doing your reading and your research and building up your knowledge and building up your understanding. And eventually, you'll come to a point where you can't really fit anymore in your head, and you're not really sure what way to go. And you've got all of these ideas. And that's the point of maximum divergence. That's when the top triangle up here reaches its bottom point, where you've got that maximum divergence. And that's your brain saying to you, OK, now it's time to converge and to start bringing all of this together. And that's when you start then getting rid of the ideas you don't want and bringing things down into a point and deciding, I don't need to read that paper. or I'm not going to use that research that I've read. I'm going to focus down on this piece here. And that's when you converge. The difficulty is when we go from, try to go from the point of one triangle through to the point of the other without allowing ourselves the time and the space to actually create all of the things we need to do. So when you're getting going with a task, you, it's useful to just start thinking about just thinking. Just what do I know and understand about this topic? Remember, academic work takes place in your brain, not on the page or on, on the screen or on your keyboard. It's the thinking that creates the work. So just sit and think. And that means you can think about this on the bus, in a car, when you're out for a run. You, know, you don't have to be at your desk to do academic work. Then you can read and research and let the ideas build and generate in your head. You don't need to know straight away what you're going to do your piece of work about. You can build it. Then pull together some ideas. Well, what, what could I do? Well, maybe I could write it about this or this or this. And then you can just sort of test them out. Well, do you know enough about those things? And would you need to do a little bit more reading? Then that can kind of point you in the direction of the evidence that you need to go and look at. What more evidence do I need? What more reading do I need to do? Then you can develop that, build your understanding, build your knowledge. Then think, OK, is there any other remaining gaps I need to fill in in order to, do all, to pull all of this together? Fill in all those research gaps. And then you can start to plan what you're actually going to do. Now, all of this is happening before you've come near even planning your piece of work. All of this is in the diverge triangle. Once you've then planned the assignment, then you can write your first draft. Now, the first draft is for you and you alone. Never show a first draft to anyone. Even if your tutor asks to see it, do a second draft, give them that, tell them it's your first draft. Because the first draft is just an opportunity for you to get your ideas done on paper. And if you give yourself permission to write a first draft like that, it takes all the pressure away of you having to try and get it right. What you write can be rubbish. It can make no sense in places. It doesn't matter, because it's just you starting to get your thoughts down. And then you can rework them. It's much easier to rework a draft that you've got there than it is to write on a blank page. And when you come back to it, you may find that actually there's more of it that's, that's good than you first realized. And then you can rework it and reshape it. Draft, draft, draft. Writing is drafting. Those of us who write academic work and academic papers, people like myself, we draft sometimes dozens of times before we submit something so that it can build. And then we're not putting pressure on any one draft to be perfect. And then you will get to the piece of work at the end. But that's building the academic pieces of work. They build in iterations. They build step by step, bit by bit. But most of it's in your mind. Most of it's just about the thinking and the reading that you do, building it up to the point where you get that plan. And then you can get going. So don't try and do the assignment all in one go. Start with one small little thing, which is 
what do I need to think about? What do I need to start reading? And that's, your, that's it, that's your first step. You don't need to do any more than that. Think about that, and then you can identify, then you can do a bit of reading, and then you build from there. Remember to keep notes when you're reading as well. There's nothing more frustrating than reading something really great and then not being able to remember where, where it was. Now, when it comes to generating ideas, um, that's also a particularly creative piece of work. Um, and very often it, it's something that we can get a little bit stuck around because we're kind of almost waiting for a magic wand to help us sort of magically generate these ideas and out of thin air. But of course, they don't come out of thin air. They come out of our mind. They come out of our brain with all of the things that we've already learned, all of the knowledge and understanding that we have, all of the things that we're pulling together. So there's a number of things you can do to kind of help you generate those ideas. The first of all is about providing the right foundation. So because your creative ideas are coming out of your brain, one of the things that you need to do is actually look after your brain as a biological thing. So that means those basic things like keeping your brain hydrated, eating regularly so you've got energy, getting sunlight, your brain needs sunlight, getting regular good night's sleep. Sleep is so important to our creativity and to our academic performance overall. But it also is about feeding at those other things like social connection with other people so that your brain is kind of existing in a nice balanced space, rested, relaxed, energized, having had all the right nutrients, and then it will be ready to generate those ideas for you. Incubation is also a really important part of all of this. Incubation is where you, you, you kind of think about a problem and then you stop thinking about it and you let it slide to the back of your mind. Now, if you've ever had the experience of trying to remember a person's name and just not being able to get it, just I can't, it's on the tip of my tongue, I can't remember it. And then you stop trying to think about it, you go away and do something else and then you suddenly think, it's Keith! And it just pops back into your brain. That's incubation, okay? What happens is the problem slides into your unconscious mind, which is a, is a more powerful processor, if you like. And then that generates, the, that generates the answer, it comes up with the answer. So we can do this by using little things like mild distraction, um, just going off and doing something else that takes your attention away to something else so that the problem can incubate in your brain and, and generate some answers. It's also why it's so important to use all of the time you've got on your academic piece of work so you can read and think and then stop thinking about it and give your brain lots of time to kind of incubate what you've been working on and generate new, new ideas. Now, using mild distraction, is one of the key tasks that you can do to, to kind of help with that. So let me explain where this comes from. There's, a, there's an experiment um, that was done by psychologists using Lego bricks, different colors of Lego brick. And what they did was they got kind of three groups of participants. And the first lot they said, just, just sit in front of, well, actually, so the first thing they did was they got people to come up with all the different ways in which they could use a house brick. This was the first task. Uh, and people come up with things like, well, you can use it as a doorstop or a paperweight or whatever. So they were just trying to generate lots of creative ideas about how you could use a brick. Then they were split into three groups. The first group were told to sit in front of a pile of Lego bricks and not do anything for a few minutes. The next group were told to arrange the Lego bricks into different colors. And the third group were told to build a house using the Lego bricks. And after that, all of them were brought back in front of the house brick and, was, and, and the experimenter said, okay, now come up with more ways of using this house brick that you haven't come up with before. And one group was considerably more creative than the other two. I wonder if you can guess which one it is. It was actually the group that were asked to arrange the Lego bricks into different colors. Because that was just mildly distracting. That allowed the problem to slip back into the brain so it could be incubated. And then ideas were being generated in the background so that when they came back to the problem again, they had more ideas. The people who, didn't, who just had to sit in front of the Lego bricks, they weren't distracted enough. They were still thinking about the problem in the front of their mind. Those who were building a house, that was too demanding a task, actually. That wiped out all the focus on the problem completely. So mild distraction can work. Now, you can do this. Not, for me, I, I move washing around the house. That's the thing I find mildly distracting. I can do it without thinking about it too much. And then when I come back to the problem, I find I have a whole load of new ideas that I didn't have before. But sometimes people find doodling can help or you know, other things like that that just slightly take your mind off the task but aren't too mentally demanding. The other thing, you can sometimes do things in an unusual way. So the Dutch experimenters did this by getting people to make sandwiches in an unusual way, but you can do it by making your cup of coffee the wrong way around. So pour the hot water and then put the coffee in. That, you know, that, and what you're doing is you're stimulating your mind with something novel. When our mind comes across something that's unusual, it jolts into a, oh, this is new, this is novel. And then that puts it into a mind state where it's more able to generate creative ideas. There's a very long history of people going for a walk in order to aid creativity. There's something about the way in which we move and the way in which we walk, that kind of um, lateral movement that just stimulates the brain and helps us 
to come up with more ideas, to, to, to make new connections and, and to find our way through things. And it also, you know, because it, it changes your breathing and you're getting sunlight and some fresh air and you're getting some exercise, helps to bring down any of the stress levels you might be experiencing as well, which again, clears your brain, making it more possible for you to come up with those ideas. And then the final thing that's really important is when you get a new idea, you've got to be very, very gentle with it. All new ideas have problems. Whenever any new idea that you look at, you could dismiss and go, no, that's rubbish. Look at this. This is wrong. It's true for all new ideas. But if you let them grow and develop and build, then they can acquire strength. And then you can address the weaknesses in them and you can build them up and add them to other ideas. And before you know where you are, you've got your whole piece of work planned. So if you have a new idea for what you could do, don't be critical about it straight away. Let it build in your mind. Write it down. Plan out what's good about it. Think about what's positive and how it could work before you start critiquing it. Otherwise, you'll just squash all of your new ideas flat straight away. And then you'll never be able to come up with anything that actually gets you anywhere because you're stamping down on your new ideas before you get a chance to think about them. Thank you, Gareth. Lots of, uh, lots of practical tips there for students to take forward. Um, in Be Well, Learn Well, you talk about perfectionism being the enemy of ambition. How can students take control of perfectionism and strike a balance between ambitious and achievable goals? Yeah, I mean, it, it's really good to be ambitious. There's nothing wrong with being ambitious. There's nothing wrong with wanting to change the world. If you want to change the world, I mean, God knows it needs changing. Go and do it. Absolutely. Be as ambitious as you possibly want. But it's important to focus it on those things that really matter. It's important to focus them on those intrinsic goals rather than, you know, wanting to impress people, for instance, because that can be a little bit of a trap. But I'll tell a little, I think I've got just a little bit of a story about this one. You know, Alexander Fleming, um, who discovered penicillin, you know, it, it, it's lucky for us that he wasn't a perfectionist because, you know, he set up his experiment in his lab, um, came back in after the weekend and discovered the whole experiment had gone wrong because this fungus had gone in and killed the bacteria that he was trying to grow. And if he'd been a perfectionist, he would have thrown it in the bin, gone home, buried his head under the pillow and said, I'm a rubbish scientist. I don't know why I ever tried. But because he wasn't a perfectionist, what he did instead was he looked at the bacteria and, uh, at, the, at the mold and went, oh, that's interesting. What's going on there? And as a result of which he discovered penicillin and saved millions of lives. The point about academia is not to try and be perfect. Perfect is dull. It's boring. It's like those paintings that look like photographs. You know, they're, they're really accurate renderings of life, but they're very boring as a painting. What we're looking for is brilliant. It, it's things that are interesting. It's things that are unusual. It's things that are insightful. It's not about perfect. You can let go of perfect. Let go of trying to be perfect. That's not where the interesting work is. Now, some of this is about thinking about what happens when things go wrong. Now, when we all have a setback, we all will have an emotional response first. That's the first thing that happens to all of us. So you might be disappointed or angry or upset, and that's perfectly okay. There's nothing wrong with you having an emotional response to things. If you feel angry, if you feel upset, that's absolutely fine. Nothing wrong with that at all. Give yourself a bit of time and space to just absorb that and look after yourself and to let all of that be okay. But then it's important to think about what you do next, because there are a number of responses that can be unhelpful, and there are responses that you can take up at that point that are helpful. So the first response we sometimes see is that after that emotional response, sometimes students go into what we call paralysis. So they just avoid thinking about it. So you get back an assignment, let's say, with a really bad mark on it, and you just go, oh, I, I just want to pretend it hasn't happened. You bury it in your bag, or you throw it in the bin. You try not to think about it. You try not to look at it, and you avoid thinking about it at all. And what that results in is, is inaction or, or, or negative action, because you're depriving yourself of the opportunity to learn from what went wrong and make sure you get it right next time. Now, remember, being a student is about learning. You're going to make mistakes. You're going to get things wrong. You're going to misjudge things on assignments. There's nothing wrong with that. That's OK, as long as you learn from it. And academics often tell us that the students who do best at the end of their third year are those students who have got assignments wrong during the course of their studies and then learned from it and grown and developed as a result. So don't worry about getting things wrong. We all make mistakes, even those of us who have been doing research for a very long time. The second route you might go down is analysis. Now, the first thing you might do is that you might start thinking about it. Now, that thinking might be um, you know, self-blame, that kind of rumination that we go into, or ruminating about your, you know, your, your, your tutor. Oh, my tutor just doesn't like me. They failed me. I'm never going to get on because they don't like me. Or, or I'm just rubbish. Why does this always happen to me? Or, 
you go into what we call rumination. And rumination is where we're packing together lots of negative things and we're going round and round a negative spiral, not really looking for solutions, just kind of ruminating and, and wallowing in, in, the, in the awfulness that's happened to us. You know, this is exactly the sort of thing that always happens to me. This is why I don't have a girlfriend, blah, 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 blah. And what that then again leads to is inaction or negative action. You, you, you don't really learn anything from it. You don't do anything positive towards your learning. You just sit and think about how rubbish you are or how rubbish your lecturers are. The alternative is that we go into what we call positive critique, where you look at it and you go, okay, I'm really upset that this happened. I'm really angry that this happened. I really wish it hadn't done. But what can I learn to make sure I'm not in this situation again in the future? And then you start, you look at your feedback, you re-look at the piece of work, you try and pick it out of it, maybe you have a conversation with your lecturer or with your peers or with a study skills mentor, you use the resources that are around you. That then will start to build your motivation to do better next time because you're planning and you've taken control of it and then you take positive action. And as a result of which, you will learn more and you will do better next time. And what can happen is you can end up being grateful for the initial setback because it means you get even better grades, you learn even more, you perform better, um, and you feel better about life as a student generally because you've learned from the setback that happened. Um, and if you can let go of perfectionism and focus on just learning from your mistakes and learning as a student and that that's what you're there for, then overall, you'll have a much better time as a student and you'll perform better academically as well. Thank you, Gareth. And um, on a closing note, um, for many students and, and intergraduates and you know people who are in the, the working world already, um, the future can feel uncertain and daunting. How can students prepare for that transition um, and sort of build up their confidence for it? Yeah, so the picture you've got in front of you is a guy called Philip Petit who walked on a tightrope between the two towers of the World Trade Center. And whenever students talk to me about how they envisage their future career and life being after university, this is the picture that comes into my head because that's what it sounds like. That's when, when students are talking about it, it's like, I have to get everything right in my entire life, otherwise I'm doomed. If I ever make a mistake, I'm just going to plummet to my doom. There is no escape. And if the world was like that and your life was like that, that's an incredibly scary place to be. But the reality is it isn't. That's not how the world works. And I know many of you have been told that you need to plan your careers in a straight line and you need to know exactly what it is you're going to be doing for the next 50 years. And you need to have a plan that's going to tell you exactly how you're going to get there. But that is utter nonsense. Please let go of it. Let go of the idea that that's how the future is going to be. If the last two years have taught us anything, it's that the future is unpredictable. Now, we can either be scared of that and pretend to ourselves that we can control it by putting together all of these plans, or we can embrace it. And actually, if we embrace it, it's much more freeing. And what you can do then is you can engage with something that we call planned happenstance. Now, if you go back and think about the meaning, pleasure, strength, Venn diagram that I showed you at the very early on in the, in the um, presentation, and you think about those things that give you meaning, that give you pleasure, and the strengths you have or the strengths you would like to build up. If you focus on all of those things and you continue to look for ways to learn and grow and development, and you look for opportunities to learn and to build up your skill set, to build up the things that you care about and are passionate about, to, to really know and understand what it is that you enjoy, and then be open to opportunity, to look out for it. So make connections with other people who, who like things that you like, who, who have the same passions that you have, so you're part of those communities. Join newsletters and, and, and lists online. Um, that are gonna tell you about opportunities that might come up. Because there will be multiple ways in which whatever is at the middle of your Venn diagram, there will be multiple ways of you meeting, finding roles and finding careers that help you meet those things that are meaningful, pleasurable, and that use your strengths. There is, won't just be one single career that gets it right. And then you can just look out for wherever those opportunities are. And to begin with, you might not get right in the middle of your Venn diagram. You might just be in one part of it. But then you can think, okay, so how do I develop from here? What's the next chance? What's the next opportunity? If you pick up an opportunity in a job and it turns out not to be meaningful or pleasurable or, or particularly using your strengths, that's okay. You can just think, okay, what was it that attracted me to this job that I thought was going to do that? And how do I move on from here? Where do I go next? What do I look for next? You will move across a number of different jobs and probably a number of different careers over the course of your working life. That doesn't matter. What matters is that you are focused on trying to produce a life that is meaningful, that has purpose for you, that has the right amount of stretch, that is pleasurable, that you enjoy as much as possible, 
and that you feel competent at doing, that you feel that you're really able to add something of value. Because wherever you are where you're doing that, that will have a huge impact on your well-being. You will then be doing it well. And as a result of which, you'll also rise to the top of your career and your profession because you'll be doing it really well. Because if you find it meaningful and pleasurable and you're really good at it, you'll do it with passion, you'll do it with focus, you'll do it with commitment, and you'll be doing it really well. And people like that rise. And then you'll be re doing really well across the whole course of your career as a result. So focus in on those things. Focus in on meaning, pleasure, strength. And then after that, of course, you have to think about and how do I get paid for it? But make that the final thing that you think about once you've thought about all of those other things. And then just be open to opportunity. Just look around for the possibilities of opportunity. Um, and take things up, take up those opportunities as they come along. Don't plan in a straight line. Plan yourself. Plan who you want to be and how you want to develop and how you want to grow. And then look for the opportunities that are going to help continue that, to continue that development and continue that growth and continue that movement towards a life that is fulfilling for you. And then you don't have to worry about walking this tightrope because, you know, that idea is it, it's just not helpful to you. Let go of it. You don't have to live your life trying to be perfect because that's not how life works. Most of us, me included, have ended up in roles by accident. And almost everybody who I know who's got to my age is in roles that they never planned to be in in the first place. That's how the world works. So embrace it. Don't feel free from it. Don't feel you've got to get it all right today. You don't. When you're thinking about what you do next, you're only thinking about what you do next. You're not thinking about what you do for the next 50 years. Take the next step, see where that leads you, and go from there. And there will be opportunities out there for you to have a life that, that really works for you. Thank you, Gareth. I think uh, that's a great way of visualizing it and uh, a great strategy to take forward doing it one step at a time rather than thinking 15 years ahead when there might be jobs that we don't know even exist um, yeah. at this point in time. Um, I will ask Jenny if she can just come back to talk us through this slide while I have a look at who we've got on the line at the moment. Hello again everyone. So um, we have a competition that we've been running on the side. Um, so all attendees that are on the call now are entered into it and Rosie is just whizzing through all the names to pick out a winner so if, when she shouts out your name hopefully it's you um then if you just send rosie your address details and um you will get receive a free copy of gareth's book be well and learn well thank How are we you doing, Jenny? Rosie? um we are good so we have manisha moose and irene hogan and i will get in touch um with each of you after after the webinar today and um, sort out your address and, and sending it out. Um, Gareth, if you could pop the next slide up um, while we've got the Q&A and I will see if we've got some questions coming through. So we've got one from Ali to start us off actually. Is convergent thinking problem solving? And if so, what sorts of routines build this kind of thinking? So convergent and divergent thinking go together. Um, so divergent thinking is where you're generating possible solutions and convergent thinking is where you're identifying which one is likely to work best. So you go through a different process. So the divergent thinking bit is all, all the stuff I talked about in terms of creativity earlier, where you're trying to generate ideas and try and come up with different ways of looking at things and seeing things in wider perspective by letting your brain incubate it and distracting and going for walks and all of those kinds of things. In terms of convergent thinking, when you're actually trying to bring all of this down, there's a number of ways in which you can do it. You can mind map out everything that you've got and then test it for strength. Or you can just write out you know, different lists or um, work with pictures. Um, the other thing you can do also is you can test ideas out on other people. You can have conversations and debates and test out the different ideas that you're using to try and, and, and work down. And what you're looking for are the strengths and weaknesses of each of the ideas that you've got. And also to see if you can bring some of them together because sometimes the solution is to combine ideas rather than trying to pursue one or the other. So it's, it's trying to be, continue to be flexible in your thinking as you're converging and coming down to that solution that you're going to try and settle on uh, as your one point. But divergence is the beginning bit, is about the coming up with possible solutions. And converging then is deciding which one you're going to go for. But again, convergence is also a process. You don't rush that if you can. You go through a process of paring down, merging things together and, and trying to come up with something in, in one way like that. Um, it's more that tends to be more uh, 
sitting down working at a desk thing. But again, if you get lost and you're not sure, going for walks again is a good way of clearing your head and thinking about how I can bring all of this together. Walking and movement and sunshine really does help. Thank you, Gareth. I hope that answers your question, Ali. And if uh, if others have questions, then please do put them in the question box um, so I can see them and put them to Gareth. Um, while we're waiting for some of the questions to come through, Gareth, I wonder if you could give us your answers to the questions that we had up at the very beginning. Um, so what, what helps you to get work done when you're not feeling motivated? Um, I, one of the, well, one of the things I would say about that is it, it moves. That's the other thing is that when you might find at some point, point some things work for you and then they stop working because your brain gets used to them. So we have to kind of constantly surprise our brain sometimes. So it's different things at different times. I mean, I very much do try and find the, the, the emotional connection to whatever it is that I'm doing. I try and find something in it that's, that, that, that drives me and, and I'm looking for the bit of creativity in it because that's the thing that interests me most often is to, you know, what, what's the thing that's going to be really interesting and I'm going to suck me in, that's going to be, that's going to stretch me in some way and that I think is valuable, that's going to be useful to other people. Um, I tend to really only take on work that I think has meaning in it anyway. So that helps generally. So, you know, things like, you know, writing the book for, for, for students and stuff, that was, it was easy to sit down and do it because I, I cared about it. it was, it's a thing I'm passionate about. Um, so taking on pieces of work that I care about really helps. Um, and then other things can help as well. You know, I, going outside, going for walks, I, I get up and walk away from my desk a lot because I find the screen is hypnotic and it can suck you into a trance. And then you're just staring at the screen, not doing anything or getting tempted to go on the internet or social media. So walking away from the desk is really important. I try and warm up my brain before I sit down to work. So I walk around thinking about what I'm going to work on. And then I sit down at my desk once I know what I've got in my head so that I'm typing rather than, you know, trying to generate it while I'm at my desk as much. And music, music can quite often help me just kind of jolt my brain a little bit. Um, yeah. Thank you, Gareth. Um, we've got a question from Katie here saying, if you're feeling particularly unmotivated, is it better to stop trying for a day or two and to put it aside or to try and push through it? Yeah, it, it, it really depends. And I guess part of it's about thinking about why is it that you're not motivated to do this piece of work? What is it about the work that you're doing that, that, that means you're not motivated and trying to identify what that is? And that might give you your answer. If it's that you're just really not interested in this piece of work, then actually trying to engage with it and find those, rather than trying to do the piece of work, stepping back and thinking, right, how can I find an emotional connection to it? And spending your time on that day doing that, trying to find a way into caring about the piece of work and, and actually wanting to do it um, can make a difference. Um, if it's that, you know, you're, you're just overwhelmed and exhausted because you've been doing lots of other pieces of work, then actually, yeah, sometimes if you, but, but again, I would be, careful about what you're doing. If you just go and veg out in front of Netflix, flicking through stuff you're not even sure you want to watch, that's not going to be particularly helpful. But if you say to yourself, you know what, I'm exhausted, I need a break, and I'm going to be really careful with myself today, and I'm going to eat well, and I'm going to get some fresh air and a bit of exercise, and I'm going to see some of my friends, I'm going to have an early night and get a good night's sleep, and then I'm going to come back to work tomorrow, then, then that could be a, a way which actually does then give you back the energy to be motivated, because we need a bit of energy to be motivated. So it, it kind of depends why you're not feeling motivated, really. Um, you may need to build up to doing the piece of work if you've been feeling really lethargic for a while. It may be better to focus on getting yourself more active and more energetic before you try and think about the piece of academic work. So again, go to go and do a bit of exercise, try and eat something healthily. Even if the exercise, by the way, doesn't have to be going to the gym, just go for a walk, go and, go and get some fresh air. Get yourself moving, get yourself out of the rut of, of sitting around not doing anything, if that's where you are. That can be a really helpful thing. So it depends on your circumstance, but start by looking at why is it that I'm not motivated? And if you're still struggling, don't be afraid of contacting your student services department if you're in a university and, and you know, speaking to a counselor or somebody to help you figure out what's going on with your motivation, because that might be what you need to help you get there. Thank you, Gareth. Um, we've got a comment from Liz saying, great webinar. Any tips on prioritizing different activities when planning a balanced schedule? schedule? It can be overwhelming at times. Yeah, it, it absolutely can be overwhelming. And, and I, I guess one of the things is to say that none of us gets the perfect balance all of the time. You know, you, you, you'll get a perfect balance for a few minutes and then life alters and changes and moves. So, so don't put the pressure on yourself to get it absolutely right. If you're feeling overwhelmed by the amount that you have in your timetable and in, in your, your kind of your daily time, it, it's probably best to kind of think about what, what is it possible for you to take out 
while still maintaining some kind of balance. And I would think about three things. I would think, well, four things. I would think about your academic stuff, absolutely. What are you gonna do for yourself physically today? What are you gonna do that's, that's gonna help you physically? So whether that's about eating well or getting exercise or planning for a good night's sleep or whatever that is. What are you gonna do for yourself socially today? Where are you gonna contact with somebody or, or with a community or be part of something social to, to give your, because your brain needs that as well. And where am I gonna do something that's nice for me psychologically, that's gonna make me have fun or feel happy or feel engaged or feel motivated or whatever that is. And if you're managing to do some of that across the day, and it, it doesn't have to be huge things. You know, I mentioned listening to music earlier on. There's some good research that listening to music you like for 15 minutes a day can boost your well-being. Um, you know, being around trees for, for around nature generally for 20 minutes to half an hour a day has a boost will, will boost your well-being. Being in sunlight for 20 to 30 minutes a day will boost your sunlight. You don't have to do huge amounts on each of these things necessarily. Look at what's realistic in your life and try and make make it as balanced as you can with the reality of what you're working with. So I mean, you might be a, a, a parent with children that you're caring for as well. You know, that reality has to be worked with. Just try and make it as balanced as possible and don't put too much pressure on yourself to be able to do things that don't fit into the day. So try and then also be ruthless about those things that actually aren't adding value and aren't being helpful to you and that you're putting in because you feel you should do them rather than because they're actually needed. Thank you, Gareth. I think that's a, a really good point about things that you need to do and, and cutting out the things that you are putting in because you think you should be doing them. Um, we've got a question um, about so what can you do when you're you're just not motivated for anything and you're feeling unmotivated in general, there's nothing you want to do, there's nothing that you enjoy in that moment. What advice would you have for students in that situation? Um, so uh, what I would say is two things. One, small steps. Okay, if you've got to that point, trying to overhaul everything all, all in one go is just is not going to be possible. So trying to get yourself motivated for everything isn't going to be possible. Um, very often when we get into that kind of low mood that you're talking about, it kind of self-sustains you. So what it wants to do is it wants to keep you in that low demotivated place because the more demotivated you feel, the lower you feel, the more powerful it is. It almost works like a parasite that's kind of controlling your behavior to make itself more powerful. So it's about pushing back on that step by step. So trying to identify maybe if something that you're not particularly motivated and don't think you'll enjoy, but the, the least worst option. Look at, the, look at the one that's most easy for you to engage with and do, whatever that, that thing is going to be, whether it's connecting with other friends or you know, going and doing something that, that might be a little bit fun, even if it's not a lot of fun. Um, and doing something to just start to build up positive emotion in your day and a bit of routine in your, a routine and structure in your day, step by step, little steps to begin with. And I would also suggest that if you are in that place and you're struggling to take those little steps, please do go and contact your student services department because they will be able to help you work your way through where you are now back into that more positive emotional state. I would say, given what we're all coming out of, not at all a surprise that many students are finding themselves feeling exactly as you're feeling right now. We're hearing it right across the country from many different students, but it won't stay like this. It will change and small little things can build over time to make a quite significant improvement. You will not always feel like this. Your motivation will come back step by step and then use the support that's around you to help you get there. Don't be afraid of going and accessing that support because that's what it's there for. That's why people like me exist in the roles that we have. It's just to help students who are in the position that you are. And then you will come out of it. You will absolutely come out of it and you will find your motivation again, and then you'll be able to move forward. Thank you, Gareth. I, I hope that's encouraged uh, the person that had, had posed that question um, in, our, in our chat today. Um, our next one is from Emma. How um, do you ever limit how long you concentrate on an idea at a time before stopping and doing some mild distraction? No, I, generally it's about, so there's a thing called flow, which is a creative state. And when you're in flow, um, it's kind of that peak creativity where, where you're just generating lots of ideas and you're thinking it through and you're quite excited about it and you can feel the rush of it and you're, you're, you're making lots of other contacts with other memories. And when that dries up and I get stuck and I go, right, I'm not quite sure what to do next, that's when I stop thinking about it. So it's not about timing it specifically because it'll move around depending on what the idea is and what day it is and how I'm feeling. Um, so I would say when, you, when, you're, when you're, the idea is working and it's generating and you're getting it and it's all coming forward, keep working with it like that. 
And then when you, when you get stuck and when you dry out, which will naturally happen, that's when you then take a break and go off and use mild distraction and let, your, let, let the idea incubate in your brain for a while. Um, I think trying to set time limits to it is, is kind of an artificial thing. I can understand exactly why you want to do it because it, it, it makes sense to, to kind of think about it in that way. But we need to kind of, um, it's like riding the waves where if you were surfing, you know, you just have to go with the waves where they are at that time. And when then they run out, when your brain stops coming up with new stuff or it stops being quite as exciting as it was when you first had the idea, that's when you then leave it alone and go away and do something else and then come back and see what your brain's produced in the meantime. Thank you, Gareth. Um, we've got a question here from someone who's working full time and asking how you can stay motivated. They've got lots of change at work that's taking up lots of time, running a house, looking after children, everything that comes with that and feeling like there's not enough hours in the day to, to do it all. Yeah. What advice do you have there? Yeah, that, that is that is difficult. And, and, and let's not pretend. First of all, let's just accept that it is difficult and take the pressure off yourself the expectation that you should be able to do it all perfectly that you are or, or 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 that you know that, that balls aren't going to get dropped because trying to do all of that that's tough that's a, that's a tough ask that's not to say it can't be done and, and that it won't be done and there are lots of students in your circumstance who do manage to do it but but take pressure off yourself wherever you can you know it's okay if you cut some corners yeah it, it's okay if you if you don't give quite the amount of time to something that you you might sometimes think that you should give. The word should is really dangerous in this circumstance. There are no shoulds here. There is what works. Yeah. And if you're still on your course after this academic year, studying full time, uh, working full time, and looking after children, then you're doing a really good job. Okay. Um, so it's about taking off pressure wherever you can. Look for small opportunities for rest, even mini breaks that take a minute or two can be really powerful if you deliberately think of them as breaks. So taking a moment or two to just rest, relax, close your eyes, do some deep breathing, re-energize yourself and coming back to it can, can really help power you through the day. Look for those opportunities to, to kind of rest whether and, and do those other things that are nourishing. So if you can try and stay with a reasonably healthy diet, if you can get a bit of fresh air and exercise, that will actually really help. So it's just about looking at where you can get marginal gains to things that will help you with your well-being so that you feel less stressed and less overwhelmed. Because when we're overwhelmed, our motivation does go. That's just one of the things that happens. Because you know, the point about being overwhelmed and being stressed is that you're supposed to be running away from something that's dangerous. It's and obviously in your circumstance, that's that's unhelpful. So trying to help calm down those emotions, do the things that are good for you, look for small marginal increases, and then take the pressure off and accept that if you get something wrong, it's okay, it doesn't matter the world isn't going to come to an end this is about you being able to do get through all of this and do as much of it as you can and to enjoy as much of it as you can in, in, in all of those fields obviously if you've got a lot of change at work that can also be very stressful um, but remember that you know it will pass change happens in workplaces it will pass even if it means you're going to change workplaces at some point that will pass too um, and again, talk to your university support services because they'll be able to help you think about, think your way through this and, and look for other options of, of support that might be available for you. Thank you, Gareth. Um, we've got a question from Esther about, you know, what, what can you do when you've got lots of doubts about all of the work that you're producing? How can you move past that? Celebrate being an academic. Celebrate being a really good student. Having doubt is a really important part of learning. You can't learn without doubt, okay? If you insist, I know this, I must know this, I have to know this, I have to know it already, then you block the possibility of you learning anything new because if you know it already, there's no room for any new learning to come in. Doubt is the, is the open door to learning because I don't know, I'm not sure, I don't know if it's good enough, I don't know if I've learned enough, I don't know, I don't know if I understand this well enough. That means you're open to listening to new learning, to taking in new learning, yeah? And all of us, those of us who work in academia, those of us who do research, I mean, the entire field of science is based on the phrase, we don't know. You know, I don't know, we don't know stuff. So we gotta go and do some research to try and figure it out. And even then we probably won't know, but we'll just be a little bit further forward. So the fact that you, you have doubt is a really positive sign. It says that you as a student are really properly engaging with your learning and with your academic work. Um, and, and if, if you can allow that to be a strength rather than something to worry about, then you will learn more and you will perform really well and you'll probably end up being a, a really good student overall as a result. 
So the thing about worrying about doubt is that that then makes us anxious and that again then blocks learning. So try to let go of worry, let go of the concern about having doubt, be the doubt as the thing that keeps you honest. It's the thing that stops you from being complacent and just churning out a piece of work and then not doing as well as you'd like. And just look for, okay, I'm not sure. So what can I learn? What can I improve? And then when feedback comes back on your assignments, look to see what you can learn and build on from that. Doubt is absolutely fine. And if, you're, if, there's, if there's aspects of your course you're uncertain about, of course, go back and talk to your lecturers and your tutors. That's what they're there for. In the main, they're really happy to help you out. But, but learning is doubt. If you knew all of this stuff already, you wouldn't need to do a whole degree in it because you'd already know it. You'd already have it all. Doubt is good. It, it, it's, we, we can be quite uncomfortable with doubt and uncertainty as human beings sometimes. But actually, it's really good for us. If you embrace it and use it to help drive your learning forward, it makes you a better student. So work on that and work on just embracing the doubt and, and, and seeing it as a real strength. I think that's a, a good way of looking at it, Gareth, and not something I'd considered before. Um, sure. We've got a question from another student um, saying, I mean, we've touched on this with a couple of the others, but any tips to help with feelings of being overwhelmed and they're struggling with motivation because they have so many thoughts and ideas and tabs open and just end up feeling paralyzed and, and not doing anything? How might they be able to move past that? Yeah, so try and collect your thoughts and ideas together in a way which is really structured. And it might help if you get away from the screen. Screens are hypnotic, okay? Um, it also might help to just manage the emotion first. So just doing some deep breathing in, in, in the book, and you can also find some of the instructions online. We talk about 7-Eleven breathing. Um, doing some breathing exercises to help you calm down, get your emotional arousal and that feeling of being overwhelmed down. Then work in a structured way. Where, what are the ideas I have? And get them down on paper in some way um, or on a whiteboard or something, whatever you've got available to you. Um, get the ideas down. And then if you have got to the point where you've got so many ideas in your head, you can't think of them all. Remember what we said. That's you at, at your maximum amount of divergence. Your brain can't hold any more at that point. So that tells you you now need to start converging. So start stripping those ideas out and getting rid of them. You can't write about them all. So, and, and they all might be great ideas, but, but you've only got to produce one assignment. So start thinking about, okay, so what am I going to focus on this time? And it doesn't have to be the perfect choice. It just has to be a choice that's going to be a good enough for this piece of work. So start thinking about stripping down. How do I strip down to get to one idea that you can then work with because then it's it's a, a reasonable enough size to hold in your mind. So breathing, calm down, go and get a drink, go and get some fresh air, whatever it is that helps you, music can help bring our moods down, whatever it is that helps to bring the emotional arousal down for you. Then get all your ideas down on paper and all your thoughts down on paper away from the, the screen. Then start paring them down so you get to one or two ideas that you can actually work with and then start working with that and go through that stepped process rather than trying to go, as I say, from that point of maximum divergence to I know what I'm doing. You can't do that, that's too quick. Go through a process of paring it down and then get to the, to the idea that, that you're gonna work with. Thank you, Gareth. Um, I hope that answers the question for our student. Oh, it does, she says thank you. Good. Um, I think that's, that's probably all we've got time for today, um, so, you can see on the, the slide that Gareth's got up at the moment some more resources to support your well-being um, at the moment and in the future. Um, obviously, you know, do reach out to, to staff, to tutors, to your university well-being service if you do need an extra hand at the moment. Um, Jenny will be in touch after the event with a link to the recording if you want to revisit anything. Um, or if you want to share it with other friends who couldn't make it today. And I think all that's left for me to say is uh, thank you to Gareth and Jenny for your time this afternoon. And thank you everyone else for, for joining us for the past hour. Thank you all. Thank you.